Hi Joe, welcome back. This um, it is the session 13, clustering second part. And we are going to talk about now how to implement this Dirichlet process, okay? So in general, when we are working with these um, uh, processes, what we have is that these uh, pies come from some D this Dirichlet process that we're um, discussing right now. And our set eyes come from this pi. And then what I have is that these theta keys, they come from my base measure. And my x eyes come from this uh, f process also, theta set i, right? So from this process, I can generate my, and my, my data and then compute the posterior and predictives, uh, posteriors that I need. So from here, most of these things are known for, to you right now, right? Like depending on what shape do you want to select for this H, you, you know how to draw from here. And the same will happen for F. Now, the only thing that is um, unknown now is this Dirichlet process, right? So you may be thinking like how I can work with this infinite number of, of partitions and how can I can I do something with the computer if it is infinite, right? So there are some some techniques that we can use, and one of them, and most useful um, and easy to implement, is this stick breaking technique. And the idea is how think I can use this stick breaking technique to uh, infer this infinite sequence of mixture weights, right? To do my my pi over here. So imagine, like the whole idea of this is, imagine that you have this stick, okay? So this stick will have length of one. And what you simply do is you just roll a die and then you select some value, okay? So you select some beta one value and you cut your stick, right? Like you're just cutting it and it will just break in some particular random uh, place. And that place is given by your beta one. And what you end up is with two sticks one of length beta one and the other one with length one minus beta one. And what we're going to do for simplicity, just call this first uh, weight our pi one, and that, that is going to be the first value of this sequence. And then you just repeat the same process. You take the second stick over here, and then you just break it again. So what will happen is that when you break it, you will select then randomly a beta two and one minus beta two, okay? So, sorry. Now, you again just cut it in some particular place. And this becomes your pi two of the sequence. Now, the thing is that this beta two is just some random number that you just generated, right? But this stick is not length one anymore, right? So this stick is actually beta two times one minus beta one, because you are cutting this one and then you're just kind of normalizing the the the, this, this, the the weight that you are producing, right? So now this pi two is actually beta two uh, times this one minus beta one, right? So let me just write it down over here. Uh, beta two times one minus beta one. And I can continue doing this forever, right? I can just simply take one minus beta two, take some beta three over here. This will be one minus beta three. And this is a uh, little chunk here is my pi tree. And this pi tree is beta tree, right? But this beta tree is multiplied by actually my one minus beta two. And this one minus beta two is multiplied by one minus beta one. So I can continue this stick breaking process just by taking the remaining, cutting it, and then taking it, cutting it, taking it, cutting it. And what will happen is that I can produce an infinite amount of, of, uh, of weights by, by doing this. Obviously the weights are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and at some point it won't matter anymore, but I have a way of, of producing this. And this is the whole idea of, of, my, of my sequence. So what will happen is that these random values that I'm producing, they are actually distributed according to a beta distribution. So there are beta of length one and some parameter alpha that I'm going to use. And my pi's over here, my pi k 
is equal to my beta k, the last that I draw, and then I'm just going to multiply this uh, L equal to one up to k minus one of my, of my k, uh, pi k, right? One minus beta L. So I'm just producing this shape in, in a general form, right? I'm just picking my kth uh, value and then I'm just multiplying one minus beta uh, L, all of them from, from before, right? Because I need to normalize my, my stick. Um, this is equivalent of saying that I'm going to take my beta k and take the normalized uh, parts of the stick. And the normalized parts are my beta, uh, my pi's, right? Because I'm just taking pi here over one, pi two over one, pi three over one, and then I know that these ones come actually from my my original stick. So I can use that one and just take the remainder. So this will be one minus the summation of all my other uh, pi l's, right? So is an l. So that is another way of seeing this. And this whole process over here, we just call it a gem. So this is equivalent to a gem when you see this. It comes from the, their, their authors, uh, Griffiths. And Makowski. Okay, so this is uh, a gem, a gem process over here. So we just said that our our whole process comes comes from this. And so some other way of, of of seeing this is what we had before, in which we just said that our this uh, um, probability measure here, uh, with the distribution uh, over probability measures uh, G is uh, the sum of my k from one to infinity of my pi k's and then I will have my delta responses over the theta k's over this theta space and my pi's over here they are distributed according to a gem so I'm using this Dirichlet process to draw all of them and this gem also has uh, a parameter alpha and my theta k's over here they come from my base measure h so uh, h of lambda right so i can simply draw from here and then use it to produce my my final values so you know how to draw from h you just select it i just explain you how to draw from from this gem distribution over here just producing some random samples and then using those all until you are satisfied with the with the amount that you have or that they are so small that they won't uh produce any any uh or, or it won't introduce any uh information into the process that you're computing and then you just simply use that by computing the average of these delta responses that you have. And then you can use this to produce your, um, your predictions. Okay, so this is the stick breaking uh, process to, to do that. And there is another one that is called the Chinese restaurant process. Restaurant process. And this Chinese restaurant process, uh, what it's saying is, it comes from the idea that when you're entering to some Chinese restaurant, it appears that they always have some room for another table. Uh, and the whole idea is that when you're trying to do this clustering process, what you want to do is allow the data to check for the existing clusters, ex uh, check the, the existing tables, and see if they can relate to the points in those tables or in those clusters. And if they found some cluster that they like, they can just stay there. But if there is no uh, cluster that they belong to, they can create their own cluster. Basically, they can open a new table and, and get there. That is the whole idea of this. So formally, if we want to model this, what we do is we say that uh, if we have these uh, theta i's, uh, theta bar i's that are distributed according to our um, 
our g function and we have this uh, n of these ob observations observations from our Dirichlet process, right? Uh, this g that comes from this Dirichlet process of h so I'm just saying like I'm going to sample from here a g and then I'm going to use this g to sample my n observations and it will happen that they will take different uh, theta k values, right? Taking k theta k values. This is saying that when I sample from here, I'm going to find k clusters within these, these data, right? And if that happens, then I can say that the probability of these um, theta n plus one my, of my next observation belonging to that theta cluster given my previous data and my parameter, my concentration uh, value here, um, then my base measure H, this is going to be uh, 1 over alpha plus n times my alpha and then my base measure on theta plus the summation of the k uh, existing clusters, right? So this is the amount of elements that I have in each of those k clusters and some delta response of theta saying that if I am in that cluster or not. So what this is saying is just go check and see if you have existing values. So the more values you have that are similar to you because you are going to have this delta response here to be true, then uh, you have these with probability n k. If not, if you don't belong to these uh, existing k clusters here, then your deltas are going to be zero. That means like you will create a new cluster with probability alpha uh, h theta, okay? So this is allowing you to enter here and using your base measure to create a new cluster, okay? So that is that is how you use you use this. So if you go and and, and go back to the Dirichlet process, uh, yeah, the Dirichlet distribution lecture, you can see that you can derive the same uh, the same count. So basically, we're just counting the amount of samples and using the counts as as the way of of, of measuring the probability here, right? And we can try to simplify this if this is not uh, in the general case um, for discrete values. Um, so I can use some, some proxy here and use some discrete variable ci that I specify in which uh, cluster am, am I, like in which uh, theta k I belong to, then I can say the following, that the probability of this uh, set of n plus 1 to be in my set cluster given my previous, oh, sorry, n variables, uh, my parameter alpha, it's equal to, again, the same uh, ratio over here, but then I have these indicator functions instead of my distributions of my base measures over here. So z is equal to being in a, new, in a new table plus the sum of existing tables, nk, and the indicator function of uh, z equal to k. So this is the same shape as before. Now, instead of using my delta response and my h measures here in, in the continuous space, I'm just going to the discrete case in which I will just have my indicator function that will let me to, to do that. And yeah, this is the, the Chinese process. If you go through the literature, you will find out that there are new versions of this uh, restaurant process. You have the Indian uh, restaurant process, um, the Bob Fett, or also called the, the Buffett process. So the whole idea is how can you imagine these new ways of pushing uh, data through the clusters without 
trying to uh, kind of put a crutch on it, you know? How can you make them as general as possible and let it to be driven by data, okay? So in the following, we're going to talk a little bit about how to do the feeding of these uh, Dirichlet processes. So stay tuned. <laughs>